Jeremy, can we hear? No? Oh, it's because I'm online. Gotcha. So I'm going to have to speak up. Good morning, everybody! Is that good or what? Rally the troops! Everybody ready to get started? I'm excited. A lot of energy in the room. Everybody getting settled. I appreciate it. So we've got the right group here because you guys are all out there networking, making a difference in each other's lives. I really appreciate all of you showing up today for First Fridays. Hey, I would love to have people in the front row. Yes. Krista, I'll give you a card afterwards. Hey, I'll buy your lunch. Oh, fair enough. But no, thank all of you for coming out to First Fridays. I've seen a lot of you um, on social media here at First Fridays. You guys are making a difference in our community and what we do on a daily basis. And we're just pleased to see your faces and uh, especially without masks. You guys are awesome. We just really appreciate the support and everything that you do for us. And I have a great opportunity to introduce our speaker, Josh Wymore. And I'm going to make sure that I read his his bio because very, very cool guy. I've got to watch his LinkedIn videos. Um, definitely gives you tips and tricks how to be a better person. He cares about you as a, as a leader and he wants to help you make a difference. So Dr. Josh Wymore has a passion for helping people live and lead with purpose and clarity. As an executive coach, consultant, and trainer with Wymore Consulting and DDI, Josh has helped nonprofit and Fortune 500 leaders all around the world lead themselves and their teams more purposefully. He loves helping people leverage their strengths, develop a growth mindset, and become humbler leaders. Josh grew up on a Christian campground in Texas countryside where the most common forms of entertainment was my favorite part. So six-man football, because they couldn't staff an 11 football team, right? right yeah, right. And, and chasing armadillos. So if anybody has ever not done that, this is your guy. So um, before becoming a management consultant, Josh spent a decade in higher education. So as everybody knows, higher education for our kids is very important. And Josh has spent a lot of time in that side of the business. Along the way, he obtained his PhD from Pennsylvania State University. He and his family are now proud to call Fort Wayne home. To learn more about Josh's coaching, consulting, and training, visit, visit joshwymore.com. And you're asking yourselves right now, why more? After this presentation, <laughs> you're going to know why. Josh? Thanks, Jared. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, First Fridays, folks, for uh, inviting me in. Thank you all for showing up bright and early to come. It's good to see, uh, see all your bright, shining faces. Um, I'm humbled to have so many uh, humble leaders here that I respect. Um, humble to have my family here that knows exactly how much of a humble leader I am not. So they're keeping me grounded today. Um, but just thank you all for making time to, to come out. Um, let me share a little bit more about who I am. You got the armadillos part. There's a little bit more here. This is my, uh, my beautiful family. Um, we are proud to call Fort Wayne home. I'm not a, a, a Fort Wayne native, but hopefully a lifer now. Um, I met my wife here, and uh, once grandkids started popping up, we wanted to come back and be, be closer to family. We think, though, that Fort Wayne's like the coolest city in the Midwest, as my friend Christoph Desanya would say, right? And look at this, look at this beautiful downtown park. Um, we love, love being here. Um, and when I transitioned down to Fort Wayne is, is when I left higher ed and, and transitioned into full-time leadership development. And so my business is all about helping leaders get themselves and their teams unstuck. Uh, man, being stuck is just the worst, right? So how can we, through training and coaching, help people move to the next level? And for me, one of the big keys is this idea that insight does not equal practice, that insight does not equal change. Because if it did, we would all be a lot better people, right? We've all read great books. We've all taken classes, but we're not fundamentally different. So 
How do we make whatever it is in life and leadership so simple that you can actually put it into practice and start to get transformation? That's an idea that's going to animate a lot of what I'm doing today, hopefully not getting too broad, but staying focused so that you can actually get something practical and applicable out of this process. And, uh, and why humble leadership? Well, um, this is something that's been really relevant for me personally. It's been probably the most transformational idea in my life, not just in, in my leadership, but in my life. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about why that is in a second. Uh, I'm also working on a book on this process, which is part of why I'm here today, is to get your thoughts and feedback and criticisms and poke holes and stuff. Help me tighten this up. So we'll make sure to save room for questions at the end. But here's a little bit more about why I think you should care about humble leadership. Um, how many uh, entrepreneurs, small business owners in the room we have here? The side hustles. Okay, a number of you all. Um, yeah, fun work. Just imagine for a second if, if this graph represented your company's performance. So this is your company at the top. This is the, your competitors at the bottom. That, that your company was seven times better than everyone else in the market. Can you just picture that? Like seven times more revenue, seven times uh, stronger profit, seven times more, more work-life balance, whatever that is for you, that's seven times more. It'd be a pretty powerful number. It would sound a little bit like one of those LinkedIn messages you get where it's like, how would you like to get seven times more clients? Whatever. Like too good to be true. But the reality is that Jim Collins in his great book, Good to Great, analyzed these 11 companies that made this jump from just mediocre to incredible. And at that, their, their peak performance, they were doing, on average, seven times better than the competition, which is just an insane number. What's even more insane is what was at the core of these great companies. You may remember, this book came out 22 years ago, but he called it Level 5 Leadership. And for, for what he defined as Level 5 Leadership is this combination, in his words, of humility and ambition, this, this you know, personal modesty, but really this drive to succeed that wasn't ever about them, it was about their great companies. And for me, I think that really what he's talking about is really humble leadership, not just personal humility, but, but humility connected to a leadership context. Um, and that's what we're going to dig into today. Because one thing Collins did a great job of is explaining how, how humility is the foundation here, but he didn't spell out what you actually do to become a humbler leader. And for me, as a leadership development guy, that's my niche. You know, Jim Collins is amazing. He's a business development guy. But he said, quite frankly, someone asked him, well, how, how can you become a level five leader? And he's like, I don't know. I don't have data on that. That's not my lane. And hopefully we can pick up the conversation from there today to think what you can do to become a humbler leader. Maybe you'll never be the world's greatest humble leader that people write books about, but you can definitely become a humbler leader. And I want to help you hopefully inspire and equip you to do a little bit of that today. Um, and to be clear, I should say there were a lot of factors that, that Jim Collins talked about in his book, right? People had their hedgehog concepts and their flywheels and all those sorts of things. But he said, this is the, the foundation, the necessary component for all of these good to great companies. So the question that I have for you today is, if this is true, and let's assume for just a second it is, if it's true, why is not become a humbler person like the top of all of your leadership development plans? Why isn't it the number one thing you're focused on right now? Maybe that raises the question, do you have a leadership development plan? And the answer is probably no, that's a separate issue. But why isn't that your top goal? And, and I would say there's probably two reasons, if I can you know, project in your mind a little bit, two reasons why that's the case. The first is that you don't quite buy into this idea of humble leadership. All right, it sounds nice, it would be great, but frankly, you got a lot of other fish to fry right now. Now I've got these vacant positions I'm trying to fill. I gotta figure out SEO, what is SEO? I gotta figure that out right now, right? There's so many things that are ahead of that in line. And the second challenge is that maybe you just don't know what to do. Maybe you think, yeah, this would be great, but how do you become a more humble person? Isn't that just like a faith thing? Is that you know, maybe is that just a personality thing? What do I actually do to become humbler in the process? Um, so my hope today is to, is to both inspire you to answer this first question, is this actually a big deal? So you don't have to take my word for it, or even Jim Collins' word. Is this actually a big deal? And practically, what could you, what could you do today? And there's a dozen things you could do uh, to, to become humbler. I'm going to talk about those in my book, but I'm just going to focus on two today, a mindset and a behavior change that can help you become humbler. But before I do that, let me start with, uh, with just a picture of what humble leadership looks like in action. What is humble leadership? So who knows who, uh, who this gal is here? She's known as the lady with the lamp. Any nurses here? Florence Nightingale, that's right, yes. 500 points to our, uh, <laughs> our lovely contestant. Those won't buy you anything, just so you, I should tell you that. 
so yes, this is Florence Nightingale. I didn't know anything about Florence Nightingale, really, besides the fact that she was a nurse before I started research on this book. And this was a really fascinating thing I came across. So Florence, for those you don't know, she and I, I call her Flo. Um, <laughs> we're cool, we're cool like that. Um, and she's been dead for like 100 years, so she can't really uh, come after me. Um, so Flo was, was born 1820 in England to an affluent family. She was classically educated um, and really just kind of set to live this life of ease, you know, play piano, have social dinners, that kind of thing. But she heard what she felt was a call from God to become a nurse, which in the 1830s was not something that, you know, upper class Victorian women aspired to do, right? It was very menial work at the time. <coughs> Um, and in fact, her family, her family fought her on it, and she just persisted and persisted, and she was a very determined person, and so she eventually went out and became a nurse. And so in the 1850s, the British Empire uh, goes to war with the Russian Empire, and there's a war in Crimea. And stories start to come back about just the traumatic need for nurses and medical care uh, there, that people are just dying left and right. And so, so Florence loads up a couple dozen volunteers, takes a boat a couple thousand miles over to Crimea, and starts helping out. Um, on the front lines with this medical camp. And this was not like, uh, just come in and like put a cold compress on their head and you know, just talk to them and calm them down. This was a hellhole. Uh, patients were lying in their own excrement. There were rodents everywhere. People were dying from all kinds of uh, communicable diseases, um, far more so than from their war, war wounds. When she got there in 1853, the death toll, listen to this number, was 40%. If you go to the doctor, it's a coin flip, basically, whether or not you're going to make it out alive. Um, just like it's unfathomable to think about that. But, but Florence was not deterred by the situation. She dove in with this ambition to clean things up. So she got the patients that were, that were less sick, got them scrub brushes. They started cleaning the whole place, started dealing with the sanitary issues, started a laundry, uh, a cafeteria, all these sorts of things. In 18 months, Florence Nightingale, this little nurse from in the middle of nowhere, England, 18 months of being in the camp, she reduced the mortality rate from 40% to 2%. Imagine that, 40% to 2% as a volunteer. So she sails back to England and is met with this huge reception, which she did totally not anticipate. The Queen of England gives her a gift of 250,000 pounds. Okay, This is in 1856, so we're talking like 39 million pounds today. Okay. So Florence can kind of like settle in and live a life of ease again, you know, the, the thing that she had going on before, except uh, for one thing, she has a disease that she'll never get rid of that she caught in Crimea. And second, she has this huge ambition to make medical care around the world so much better. So she takes that money, she forms a training hospital, starts training nurses and, and communicating people all around the world to improve the quality of medical care. When she died, the Queen of England uh, offers to bury her in Westminster Abbey next to Charles Darwin and Charles Dickens and all these people, and, and she declines that, her family declines that, she has this quiet little state ceremony and let her family plot, that's it. That was Florence Nightingale's life, driven by this relentless ambition to do something way bigger than herself that was not about her, she pushed and she, she brought people around her to help her fulfill this mission. That's what humble leadership looks like in, in, in process. She was relentless and ambitious, but it was not for herself, it was for this greater cause. And I can share plenty of other examples. You can think of, of Nelson Mandela at the end of apartheid in South Africa. He has a chance in power to persecute all of his former captors, and instead he forgives them. You have Martin Luther King Jr. that could, you know, has this reputation. He could just coast as a, a well-paid keynote speaker for the rest of his life, but he doesn't. He gives his life for the cause of civil rights and for the rights of the poor. All these people that, that laid down their lives for something that was way bigger than themselves. Now, maybe as you hear me describe this, if you're like a, a leadership person, you may, may be thinking, okay, Josh, aren't you just describing servant leadership? Like, are you just trying to rebrand this so you can sell a book? And the answer is yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. <laughs> just kidding. No, my argument for the leadership nerds that care about this stuff is that humble leadership is actually the foundation of all other great kinds of leadership. So for me to put, put your needs ahead of my own, I've got to be able to have a purpose bigger than myself, right? It can't be just about me. I'm going to have transformational leadership or situational leadership. It's all about me figuring out what do you need and how do I as a leader adapt to give you what you need in this moment? How do I understand my limitations and, and correct those areas so my derailers aren't, aren't keeping me from being successful, right? Have they have the self-awareness and the, they draw out the best in others. You read books like Multipliers. It's the same sort of thing. Humility is this foundation, and yet we never really drill into how do I actually get more of that humility piece? I can talk about like adding the skills and competencies, but if fundamentally my character, 
my virtue, my mindset's not there, all that stuff's not really going to stand. So my argument is that humble leadership is that foundation that all of the good leadership is built on, and that's what I'm going to help you with uh, today. So first, let's explain a little bit of what, what humble leadership is. That's a picture of it, but practically, what's the nuts and bolts? And I'll start with what it's not first. It's not being a doormat, okay? Humble leadership is not losing all of your ambition, not losing your opinion, and just letting people walk all over you. You know, Florence Nightingale showed, showed that clearly. Um, the second thing is not, it's, it's not being timid and hiding in the shadows. It's not thinking, I've got nothing to offer. You know, it's about other people. It's not about me. No, I mean, you look at people like Abraham Lincoln, who you, it was not about him. It was about preserving the union. He's able to hire people in his cabinet that disagree vehemently with him, and yet he's relentless and, and firm in standing up to them and trying to keep the union together. And it's also not false modesty. It's not the, uh, well, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I, it's uh, really, I, I couldn't have done it. No, please, no. And it's not the like, you know, when someone makes a meal and you tell them it's a great meal and they're like, oh no, it was terrible. And they kind of want you to say more about how it was great. You know, it's not the false modesty, right? That's disgusting. Uh, it's not that either. Here's, here's what it is. There are four components of humble leadership that come from research. And I say from research because there's a lot of ideas about what humility is. This is not even taking into account like what different faith traditions would say. This is just what we see in social science research. And to be fair as well, there's a lot of uh, different perspectives on this. So kind of boil down everything you see here to four things. Here's the things I come up with. The first is an accurate self-perception. Okay, so, so self-awareness. As my, my friend Arlen Friesen would say, an, an accurate view of me and you, right? Here, here's who I am. Here's what I have to offer, but also here's my limitations. I understand my gifts, and I understand my, my brokenness. And this is a place that a lot of views of humility go wrong, because we often think that humility is having a low view of yourself, but that's not at all the case. Again, it's not thinking I have nothing to offer. It's recognizing what I do have to offer, and man, all the other ways I do not have what I need uh, to, to, to get things done. Um, you can almost think of this in the same way you think of emotional intelligence. There's kind of four pieces of emotional intelligence, understanding my own emotions and then managing those emotions, understanding your emotions and be able to manage that relationship. This is the core here. Because if I don't understand myself, it's really hard for me to adapt where I need to adapt, to learn what I need to learn. So this is really a, a, a key foundation. The second piece is appreciating others' strengths. And this kind of flows naturally out of the first, right? Because if I recognize my limitations, I recognize, oh, shoot, I need other people. So I can't do this on my own. I'm not the SEO guy and the marketing guy and the sales guy. I need a team around me that, that has those skills, that has these different perspectives. Um, you, you start to get this mindset that, that uh, the book Leadership and Self-Deception, they say, I recognize that I'm a person among people rather than the person among objects. Meaning, hey, I'm one of the person. I've got things to offer, so do they. I'm broken, so are they. We're just people. I, they're not objects for me to use the way I want to use. They have something really valuable to contribute. How can I draw out the best of what they have to offer? Because I have this secure identity, right? I understand who I am, and I'm okay with that. I'm then not intimidated or challenged when I can. other people are shining, right? Your excellence does not diminish my excellence because I recognize, hey, I have something to, to offer you to too. We're in our own lanes. I can be be the spotlight for other people, as my friend Davin Savanio says, instead of having to be in the spotlight all the time. I'll say that again. Humble leaders are able to be the spotlight rather than being in the spotlight. They, they highlight other people's strengths. They draw out the best what other people have to offer. That's the second piece. The third piece is growth mindset. So again, kind of building from here. Once I recognize my limitations and how much I have left to learn, which there's quite a bit there, I also see my journey and how I've gotten better over time. As I work with other people and see what they have to contribute, I recognize, oh my gosh, I've got so much to learn from them as well. Um, as I recognize my own imperfections and others as well, it, it helps me give more grace to myself and grace to others and commit to the process of getting better over time. And then the last piece, uh, which is really key, is a greater purpose. Um, this is what differentiates humility from humble leadership, okay? Humility, modesty, you know, you can kind of be there in the background, be a good team player, but without this greater purpose of something that we're pushing for, why would I ever have that difficult conversation with you to hold you accountable, right? I don't really have a reason to do that. But if our mission's on the line and I've got to do it, okay, you know what? This is not what I'd prefer to do, but this is what the, the greater purpose demands. I'm going to step up and deliver in those challenges. Those are things you see, like why Mandela forgave all his enemies. 
If his purpose was just to make himself look good and validate his struggle for power, man, he cuts their heads off or exiles them. But if his purpose is to build a united country, thinking, okay, what's the best way to unite a country? Do I punish the people that punish me, or do we have to find a way to reconcile? Reconciliation is a lot harder, but it actually is the one thing that's going to lead me to my goal. So, okay, we're going to reconcile. This is what greater leaders do. They have a purpose way bigger than themselves. It's not about them that, that they're able to, to lead other people toward. So I'll just give you one example of how this plays out. Uh, practically for me, these are my beautiful kids. This is the part where you all say, aww, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So one of my, uh, one of my purposes in life is to, is to raise good kids. And uh, the way I define that, one piece of that at least, is, is I, want, I want these kids to love Jesus and to make a difference in the world with their gifts. So that's my greater purpose. Hopefully it's not about me although that varies from day to day, right? Some days it is about me. Some days it's about me just wanting to do what I want to do without interference from my kids. That's a self-centered purpose, not a greater purpose. Um, but hopefully that's the purpose, is I want them to, to, to do something uh, bigger, bigger than themselves. So if I kind of walk through those, those four pieces of humble leadership, you know, I'd start with this accurate self-perception. Okay, that's my goal. What, what do I have to help get them there? What, what should I be able to do to, to facilitate that? Well, I, I should probably model the things that I want to talk about that, that I want them to, to embody. And I need to be aware of when I don't do that because if I'm coming up short, that's the model they're going to have is whatever they saw in their home. So I probably need to apologize to them and say, hey, you know what? Uh, I blew it. And this is not the way that we, we're trying to live. We're trying to live this different way because I'm trying to cast a different vision for them. Um, um, the second thing then is I'm going to think about the other people around me that I need in that process, realizing, man, Creating kids that are that are grounded and and you know productive and have deep character that's not something that just that a few people can do that takes a village right so who are the other families some of them are in this room other families that are living life the way I want my kids to live their life we need to pull them in I need these people both for my kids and for myself to speak into my life and tell me areas where I'm I'm blowing it and then the growth mindset too realizing that that the person I am today is not the person I want my kids to become and not who I want to become like I want to be getting better along the way and see this, this growth process happen for them. I'm not going to get frustrated when they're self-centered because we're all self-centered, right? That's the default setting. How do I help them grow into the people that, that I believe that they're made to be? Um, and so, you know, for me, honestly, I, I get this wrong probably as often as I get it right, um, maybe even more so. Um, so this is not like a, I'm not holding myself up as the exemplar, but I will say that I know I get it right a lot more than I would if I didn't have this clear purpose. I didn't have this thing to measure myself against. Because the other alternative is we default to like our self-centered purpose, right? Which is, it's about me. You know, instead of my purpose being about my kids going out to do something great, it's about me getting the adoration from, from these small people that I never got as a child. Or them living out the exploits that I always wanted to have whenever I was younger. Whatever, you know? If, you, if, if I think about my worst moments as a parent, it's when it's about me. You know, when I'm snapping at my kids in the grocery store because of their bad attitudes, it's not because I'm thinking, and my purpose is that they would become people of character, and this is not happening now. It's, well, their behavior is a reflection on my parenting. It makes me look bad, so I want you to stop. That's about me. It's not about them. That's not humble leadership. So humble leadership really draws out the best of us, uh, whether it's in parenting or whether it's in leadership. It's a really powerful idea. So the question is, does this actually work, though? We have this stuff from Jim Collins that says it does. But is that actually true? Is there any evidence beyond that? That was 20 years ago. Does it truly play out? Well, this is obviously a rhetorical question at this point because I'm 20 minutes in this presentation. I would not still be talking about it if it didn't work. Um, but just to give you a little bit more evidence of why I think that this is powerful, here's three things. First of all, humility uh, produces lower stress and greater happiness for people. Okay, so just going back to my parenting example, for instance, if I had this healthy separation between my kids and me, you know, their behavior does not create instant stress in me because I recognize, you know what, they're independent people. I can't control them. How can I help them be better? But you know what, I need to take a step back and realize what I can and can't control. What's interesting about this is that, um, is that the, the stress and happiness differences are greatest whenever life events are the hardest. So if I just had a spouse pass away, if I just overcame a, a, a huge disease, something like that, those are places where humility makes the biggest difference. I'm seeing myself in right relationship to the universe and recognize how, how blessed I am and how limited I am and, and all, all the good things in my life. You know, those sorts of things actually make me into a better person. 
So this alone, if this was the only bullet point, right, this would be worth pursuing. I think we could all do with a little less stress and a little more happiness, right? But just think about this as a leader. If you are less stressed and more happy, how do you think it's going to impact your people? How many of your bosses would you like to be a little less stressed and a little more happy? Please don't raise your hands. Um, some of them may be here in the room. So this is a, this is a huge outcome. But above and beyond this, um, humble leaders build stronger teams. Uh, there is an eight-part study led by Bradley Owens out of SUNY Buffalo. And what he found is that humble leaders, um, because, again, their ego is not kind of the big thing in the room, they could have really contentious debate and make better decisions because they didn't need to be the one that was always right in the conversation. There's a crazy concept. Um, they, they had this growth mindset, and so when people made mistakes and, and brought those mistakes, those mistakes were revealed, they focused on like the growth process and learning instead of punishing them and humiliating them, so then they went to hide their mistakes later, said they realized, holy cow, I can just, it's okay to be a human person that has flaws, I can get better in the process, and so they brought their best to work and they got better every day. So just incredible things, and as a result, these stronger teams produce superior firm performance. A separate study by Amy O and uh, several of her collaborators looked at, um, at technology firms, 105 CEOs, and measured their humility and a lot of other factors to understand does the CEO's humility actually have an impact on the bottom line? And the answer is resounding yes. Those companies outperformed their peer companies over time because the same things, right? They're, they're recruiting great people. They're drawing out the best in them. They're having really good debate. That They're multiplying the impact of the people around them. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not acting as geniuses. They're the genius makers, as Liz Wiseman and Greg McEwen would say in multipliers. So they produce a higher return on assets over time. So... Sounds great, right? Everyone ready to get on board? Ready to get on board with, uh, with humble leadership? This leads to the, the last big question, which is, okay, what do I actually do to become a humbler leader? As I mentioned at the top, um, there are a lot of things you could do. I'm just gonna focus on two, a, a mindset and a behavior change. First, let me talk about the mindset. This is what, uh, what I call the humility paradox. So a paradox is, are two Seemingly contradictory things, when you take them together, are true. Um, and that was what, part of what confused Jim Collins and his research team, is this paradox of these people who are really nice, but also like really ambitious. How does the things coexist together? And humility at its core is also a paradox, but in a little bit of a different way. There's really two different extremes that you want to go down at the same time that create this humility in the process. And it's understanding both the abundance of your blessings and the depth of your shortcomings. Let me explain a little bit here. I'll start with shortcomings. So shortcomings are, are everything from mistakes I've made as a person, right? The time I was snippy with my kids or with my wife or when I was arrogant or, or whatever. Um, some of them are, are just natural limitations, right? Man, I, I wish I understood this, but I just, I don't know that, you know? Um, I wish that my would have been born this way, but I didn't come with those set of skills, whatever it is. Um, for me, uh, you know, it's a true life example. It's, man, I talked so much in that coaching call. I thought I had so many good things to say. Man, that's not how I wanted to show up. Um, so wh whatever it is, I, I recognize I've got a lot of shortcomings. And for me, as someone that, that tends to err toward like the arrogant side of uh, life, this is super grounding for me to recognize like, okay, I'm, I do not have it all together. Here's all the things that, that I'm coming up short with. So if I stopped here and I just kind of wallowed here, I'd probably end up depressed. Right? I'm just thinking all the time about all the issues I have. And for some of you, this is your default setting. All you think about are the things that you could have done better, could have, could have done differently. And this is not a healthy place to live. This is why we need the other extreme as well, which is the abundance of your blessings. These are all the things that you have been given. You know, being born into a stable family where your parents loved you, that is not a given. I had foster kids. I know that that should be a given, and it's not a given. That's a huge blessing you received. If you were able to go to a good school, if you're able-bodied, you know, whatever those things are, things that you, you have not earned at all that are just given to you, those are incredible blessings. Then there's even though the things that you've developed, you've worked hard to cultivate, the strengths in your life, the competencies you, you have to, to bring to the world. These are things you have to contribute. You know, for me, I was thinking, okay, even though I talked a lot in the last call, I asked some good questions. Okay, let me focus on what I can do better to, to ask some really good questions. These two things balance each other out. If I just focus on the top line and not the bottom line, I start to think that I'm the world's most amazing gift to everyone, right? Um, that's the thing about a gift. A gift isn't a gift if you've earned it. 
And if all I'm thinking about is all the things I've got, I don't recognize the fact that I didn't earn a lot of the stuff, right? I'm standing on the shoulders of a, a lot of other people that have come before me. You know, a, a dad that worked jobs he hated, you know, for people that he loved. Um, I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. And so I can't take credit for this stuff. And there's a certain amount you can take credit for, right? You can be proud of the efforts you invested, but there's so much more you haven't. And so living in this tension, the further I go down both of these paths, the greater the humility that's created and the tension between those things. And you can kind of feel within yourself where I'm at. Like, okay, am I drifting more towards the, I think I'm amazing or I think I'm terrible? Okay, where do I need to kind of course correct and kind of, I'm far enough down this path. Let me go down this path a little bit more now and create some more of that, that healthy tension. So, um, so practically what this could look like is just, hey, at the, at the end of a day or the beginning of a day, reflecting on both of these things. Man, where did I blow it today? Um, where, where did I, I really come up short? But also, man, who loved me really well when I was inadequate? Um, where did I add some real value to, to, to my organization? Living in that tension is just a really healthy, healthy process, using this as a reflective exercise. When you do this, I think it creates this, this healthy confidence without arrogance. It creates this, uh, yeah, this, this self-awareness that's really grounded in, in reality. And you stop striving as much to try and prove yourself because you recognize how much of the stuff you have no control over anyway. So this is the humility paradox. Again, one of those mindsets. The second one is a behavior. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a concept from two researchers, Will Phelps and Neil Van Kwakabeke. It's a Dutch name. I've worked really hard to practice that correctly. Um, they, they call this respectful inquiry. And this is really essential for humble leadership because respectful inquiry is a way of asking questions and approaching conversations that show self-awareness, that shows appreciation for other strengths, that demonstrates the growth mindset and helps you live out that greater purpose. And here's what it looks like. There's three pieces. It's a high volume of open questions framed by active listening. In other words, I'm asking a lot of questions because I really want to understand you and I'm actually listening to you in the process. Um, and I'll say th these open questions are different from closed questions. You probably know this already, but closed questions are questions that have like one right answer. Like, hey, can you be here at eight tomorrow? Yes or no? Or those questions, suggestions that are actually just phrases, questions like, don't you think it would be a good idea if you had a conversation with her? You know, that's a, that's a pretty leading question. So just a few tips while we're on the topic of, op of how to ask it open questions. Uh, two things. First is, is use how and what questions rather than why questions. So if I ask you, hey, why'd you tip that waiter 20%? You may think, wait, did, is that too much or was that too little? Uh, let me explain. Uh, like you feel the need to defend that. Versus if I say, hey, what factors were you considering when you decided how much to tip? That still kind of maybe raises a question in your mind, but you can actually isolate a little bit of the, the variables instead of feeling the need to defend yourself. You know, if you've ever asked a kid, why did you hit your brother, right? There's no good answer from that. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, what, what got you so upset that you felt like you needed to hit your brother? Maybe they can isolate a little bit more. So how, how and what versus why questions. Um, a second is av avoiding questions where you is the second word, okay? Should you, could you, have you, those are all suggestions, right? And so asking more, instead of like, you know, sh should you apologize to her? Instead saying, so how do you want to proceed with that relationship? That leaves it open. Maybe apologizing is the right thing. Maybe it's something else. Either way, if it is apologizing, it's your idea, not mine. You know, if I say, should you apologize? And the answer is like, uh, yes, I probably should, right? And it's kind of begrudging. But instead of it's like, you know what? I, I should apologize. Okay, you've now got a little bit more ownership over that idea. Um, the last thing is to clarify. If someone says something you don't understand, it does not make you look stupid to say, Okay, so just so I understand, and then to, to, to restate back what they said. That actually shows that you were listening, which is a huge win. Uh, and the odds are, if you didn't understand it, they may not have understood it either. They may have said something that they didn't fully understand, and now as you say it back to them, they understand better what they think. And you've created some insight in that conversation. So just, just three little ways to, to, to ask better open questions. What makes this so powerful is that at the core, it's really a vulnerable process. When I ask you a question, I'm saying, you have something that I don't know, right? I'm demonstrating humility in that moment. I'm giving you control of the conversation. I'm showing that I value your input. And that's really the three, three effects that, that this creates is control, competence, and connection. Because when I ask a question, I'm saying, okay, I'm not in charge of the conversation anymore. As long as I'm talking right now, I have total control of the conversation. 
Uh, it's a power move for me in this moment. But when I ask you a question, open up to the audience, I have no idea what's going to come out of your mouths, right? I'm giving you control, and that's a very empowering thing. To, to, for someone to give you control means they trust you. And if we're honest, we don't trust people, and this is part of the reason we don't ask a lot of questions. Is I, don't want them to, I want them to say what I want them to say rather than really wanting to know what, what it is they have to say. But if we're going to be humble, we've got to find a way to give over control. The, the second thing is it creates a feeling of competence because it says you have something to offer that I don't. I'm not here just to tell you what to do. You've got some insight. What is it? Um, I experienced this the other day. I was, I was coaching a, a, a really successful senior executive and um, she had been a CEO of a company and now is moving into a senior leadership at a much larger company. And, um, and she has some concerns about some of her uh, leadership assessment results. And she's like, you're going to tell me how to fix all this, right? Kind of jokingly at the beginning of our call. And I said, no. She's like, what? She's like, no, I'll help you figure out how to fix it, but I can't tell you how to fix it. You know, like it's, you've got to, I got to figure that out together with you. It was like, Okay, a little bit of nervousness, right? Because it's kind of like, why am I paying so much for this call? This person's not going to tell me what to do. But at the end of our call, you know, she, she had one particular problem where you know, she was trying to like wrestle with a lot of data and figure out how to do that. And just asking a few questions of like, okay, well, who are some resources you could, you could draw on? Or what's some other ways to approach this problem? She started to produce ideas. She had all the insights she needed inside of her. She just didn't know it yet. She was being drawn out. And that's what open questions do, is it really reveals other people's competence. And they feel really good when they leave that conversation. Not because you told them something great, because they realize they were way more powerful than they thought they were. This is a, open questions are a very empowering thing when done well. And the last piece is connection. When, when I really sit and listen to you, it creates this feeling that I value your perspective. And, and this can change people's lives. I mean, it can, it can really change people's lives. I, I had just a very small experience of this a, a couple weeks ago. I was working in our toddler room at church, which is not my lane, uh, but I stepped in because they had a need in the moment, and uh, there was this little boy who was just like sobbing and like holding on to the gate. It was like he had been in prison for life. It was being tortured, you know what I'm talking about? At the big crocodile tears, and so I like try to like play with him a little bit, and I can get him distracted for like 60 seconds, and he'll stop crying, and then he just like realizes, oh wait, my mom's not here again, and goes back and starts like shaking the gate, and so I started thinking through, okay, what would I do if this was like a leader? You know, like I'm trying to like Compare this to a toddler. <laughs> um, leaders cry too. They just like tamp it way down and then it just like turns into rage later or something. I don't know. Um, and so I just like, I put my hand on his shoulder and I was like, it's, are you really sad that your mom's gone? And he's just like, yeah. I was like, yeah, it's really sad to not be with our moms. She, she's going to come back. I understand though why you're sad. And like a minute later, he was fine. And he just like played the rest of the time. I think, you know, and I don't even know this kid, and he's probably like, why is this grown-up guy touching me? Um, <laughs> but I, I think what was powerful in that is a sense of connection. Like, hey, I see you. I see you. I see what you're feeling. I can't make it better. Your mom's not coming back right now, but I see you. And there was something about that that I think, I don't know, he's 18 months old. I don't know what he really thought, but I think what he thought is, yeah, I'm seen. So I can, I can calm down a little bit, you know? And just think, like, when you, when you see someone, when somebody's having, when your cashier's having a tough day, and you say, hey, how are you? And it's not like a, hey, how are you? But it's a, hey, how are you? Seems like you're having a tough day. And they start crying, and you don't, like, get awkward and walk away, but you just kind of stand there and listen. Like, that can change the course of somebody's life. That changes how they treat their kids when they go home at the end of the day. It changes their attitude towards their work. You know, we have the power as, as, as mortal human beings to literally change the quality and direction of people's lives just by the way we talk to them. And as a leader, especially, you have so much power here. You have so much power. So uh, now we get to the fun part. This is your turn to think about what you want to do with everything that we talked about. If you actually lived in, leaned into these, this mindset uh, and this behavior, the really cool part about this is, is that you actually show up as a humbler leader today. So it's not like you, you do like a, a personality overhaul and now you're a humbler person, right? The reason I use the word humbler is you're becoming a little bit more humble than you were before. And when I ask you an open-ended question and listen to you really well, I'm being humble in that moment. So I'm being the kind of person I want to be. And as I do that and hear what you have to say, I learn, oh, wow, I have a lot to learn from these people. They're actually really smart. I should do more of this. And that makes me a little bit more humble and a little bit more humble. And even if I never get more humble, you experience the benefits in that moment of that humility, which is a great thing too. The same thing with the humility paradox. It starts to shift that mindset. It starts to change me a little bit. 
So we've covered a lot of ground, and, and I hope the thing you hear from this is, is not like, here's this laundry list of stuff you need to do to be a good leader. But I hope what you hear is, here's like one thing I could do today that would make me a little bit humbler, especially if I did it day after day after day. Um, if you've gained some, some clarity or some insight on something that would help you live more purposefully, I hope you write it down. I hope I saw some people taking notes. I hope you take and type it into your phone or write it down. If you write it down, research shows you're much more likely to remember it and actually act on it. If you're really serious, make a commitment to actually putting it into practice and then tell somebody about it and ask them to ask you about it in a week. That'll level it up even more. And if you're like uber serious, like, man, this would really make a difference in my life, hire a coach. And yes, that's self-serving of me to say because I am a coach, but I'll say for having been on the other side of coaching, that there's not been anything that's been more transformational more quickly than being on the other side of a coach. It doesn't have to be me. Find a good coach somewhere. But coaching can be a really powerful process. Um, and I'd be glad to talk to you more about that if, if you're interested in that. Um, one of the tools I've, I've put together today to help you with this process is just a really quick survey that helps you capture your main thoughts. What was my big insight? What do I want to do with this? And I'm going to link to that here in just a minute. Those QR codes you'll see, I'm going to put it up on the screen too. I just let you type that stuff down so that you, you can uh, keep track of it. But two more quick resources before I wrap up and then take questions. Uh, the first is a video podcast, uh, Sparks, that I produce. It's three, three minutes every couple of weeks with just one idea that you can put into practice to become a better leader today. If you're interested, when you do your, uh, do your little survey, there's a chance to subscribe there if that's something that's interesting to you. Um, and if you want accountability, if you want me to follow up and say, hey, you said at First Fridays you were going to do this thing last week. Did you actually do it? You can check a box for that too, and I'll follow up with you about that if you want that. Um, but um, what I'd ask you to do, if you're interested, if you really want to get better at this stuff, or if you just want to like, have more information about the book, you can do all that stuff through this QR code, which if you pull your phone out and use your camera, hold it over this, it'll send you to a link. It's a two-minute survey with three, three main questions. And again, there's codes on the table if you can't reach it from up there. Um, but before I wrap up and before I take questions, I just want to end with a little bit of encouragement. I know, hopefully today, I, I've set the bar high for what great leadership looks like. And, and hopefully that's a nice, like, both vision of what could be and inspiration, but also like kicking the pants to realize I need to up my game. I need to become a bit more humbler today. And so for those of you that are maybe feeling a little bit like, oh gosh, this is kind of daunting. I don't know about this. Man, Josh, if you, just, if you knew me and knew my, my upbringing, you'd know how hard this is for me. You know, if you knew my boss, you'd understand this, is, this sounds great in, in theory, but practically this is just not possible for me. What I would challenge you to do today is to spend a little bit less time focusing on where you're not and focus on where you could be if you just did a little bit today. If you took one of these things, if you just started asking two more good questions in the course of your day today and do that every day, day after day after day. Just imagine how that would transform you and transform your work environment. I had this background of the Grand Canyon the whole time. And the reason I chose that is that the Grand Canyon wasn't formed because someone got a, a task force together and said, hey, let's dig a big hole in Arizona so people will actually come to the desert. Wasn't why they did it, right? This is millions of years of just water passing over the same rocks again and again, and it cuts through and, and creates this beautiful, majestic, natural um, natural wonder. And it's the same thing with your leadership, right? Your legacy is written every day. And the way you choose to invest little things day after day after day changes the, the course and the character of your life. And so imagine if you started doing a little bit of that, yeah, maybe you would never become the world's humblest leader people write autobiographies about, but you would definitely become humbler. And who knows, maybe it's your retirement party or your funeral. One of the things people say about you is, man, Chris was just one of those people that, that always cared about you, was always present in the room, always drew out your best. Um, that, that could be your legacy if you take a small step today of just becoming a little bit humbler today. Thank you very much for your time. Today. Yep, room for questions. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great information, and a lot of people in this room, I'm sure they can really use this information. For me, it was the respectful inquiry. I'm mm. going to use that immediately. A high volume of open questions framed by active listening. We got it. We're going to do this. Let's give it up again for Dr. Jack. Thank you so much.
going to take a few questions. Before we do that, I want to remind you, next month, April 1st, it is not a full. We will be here April 1st for our next First Fridays. Our own Cassie Lamb is going to talk about riding the wave. So hopefully you will all join us for that. So put that on your calendar. One other thing I always want to mention, if you have your phones out, which most of you do, because you should be doing this, make sure that you follow us on LinkedIn. Okay, First Fridays, Fort Wayne on LinkedIn. A lot of the information is there and such. Okay. Who has a question that they'd like to pose to Dr. Josh Weimar? Yes, Jennifer. Can you talk about the connection between being humbler and vulnerability? Mm, great question. For those of you who didn't hear, she said, what's the connection between uh, humility, being humbler, and vulnerability? Uh, integral, right? I mean, the, the, the accurate self-aware, self-perception says like, yeah, if, I, if I'm pretending to be perfect, the only person I'm fooling is myself. The other people, they see right through me, and it actually it, it lowers their estimation of who I am because they can tell I'm hiding something. And they think, okay, if he's hiding this, what else is he hiding? And so it totally breaks down that trust. And so really one of the things that research shows really interesting is that, that uh, sec security, like security in your own identity, is both like a precedent for humility and an outcome of humility, meaning... If I'm insecure in myself, it's really hard to, you know, draw on other people's strengths. But as I do that, I actually become more secure at the same time. And vulnerability is kind of the thread that weaves through all that stuff. As I'm secure enough to actually be vulnerable, maybe even because it's just, it's not comfortable because I recognize it serves that greater purpose and I've got to do it for my people to connect with me. It, it's this catalyst, this engine for building trust in relationships and, and deepening humility as well. So, yeah, it's... Totally, totally connected. I got one section of the book just about vulnerability, so I'm glad you asked. Thank you. Other questions? The one thing I did fail to mention is if you didn't get the QR code or if you're a person that still likes business cards, there are business cards on the table right here that you can grab as well. Thanks, Anise. Yes. So the question was, what's another resource for respectful inquiry? It's actually a journal article, I think, in the Academy of Management or Academy of Management Journal. Um, so if you're into research articles, you can read that. I don't think they have a book about it yet. Um, I, I'd say a book that gets kind of in this direction, they don't use the same language, but it helps ask better questions, is The Coaching Habit by Michael Bungay Stanier. It's a great book, even if you're not a coach. It just helps you think about how to ask better questions. Um, so that'd be a good, really practical resource that I'd suggest. Great question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So if we have a small window to have a conversation where we have a goal and it's an objective and the person that we have the conversation takes over, mm. runs their gamut, and you really, you really seriously only have a window, how do you bring it back? How do you interrupt kindly? From the person who's all about an arrogant maybe. Yeah. This is like hypothetical for you, right? You're just like totally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So her question is if someone takes over conversation, you got a short time period, how do you respectfully pull it back in and give what you want to go? I think I start with this greater purpose question, like what's your purpose for interacting in that moment? So like, do you need to transmit some information? Are you trying to get the person on board with an initiative? Are you trying to connect with the individual? Because man, your tactic's gonna vary tremendously based on what you really want to accomplish. Sometimes it may mean letting them talk, sometimes it may mean saying, hey, the building's on fire, I know that your pet's dying, but what I came to tell you is we gotta go like right now, right? Like I'm gonna interact very differently depending on the purpose of the conversation. and so. Yeah, I'm not going to give advice, but I will say, the one piece of advice I'll say is before you react, step back and think, what's my purpose and what best accomplishes that purpose? Any skeptics that want to like poke holes in anything here? I'd I welcome it. I'd love the trying to do growth mindset here. So please bring it on. First one you mentioned into uh, uh, the four components of humble leadership was accurate self-perception, right? And um, 
you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I read like everybody has I don't know, eight to ten blind spots, mm -hmm. things that everybody sees about you, but that you don't see about yourself. Um, how would you ask a, uh, a coach or a mentor or someone to help you be more self-aware about those things? Uh, how would you basically um, help, like, ask them to help you in the right way? Yeah. So the question here was, if, if you have all these blind spots as a leader, how do you help draw some insight in from, from mentors and coaches? Understand yeah. that correctly? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a, a couple ways ranging from like impersonal to highly personal. So like on an impersonal side, you know, that's what I think personality assessments can be great for that stuff. So whether it's the Enneagram or the Live Style or Clifton Strengths, those help bring some level of self-awareness. On the you know, kind of moving down that continuum toward the more relationally, like things like 360 degree surveys, especially if you're in a work environment. Um, you, know, you can just create those yourself if you want. It may not be a very good one, but you could do that, right? You could send a survey out and say, hey, here's some questions I have about myself. This is how I see myself. What do you think? Um, obviously, the more you work with, with people that know how to do those things well, like, like coaches and consultants, they can get stronger. But then even on just like the highly informal relational side, um, I think just even asking the question of like, what do you see in myself that, that I don't see? Um, you know, I think bad leaders ignore criticism. Good leaders welcome it when, they, when it comes to them, but great leaders go hunting for it. Like, I want to make it so easy for you to tell me some bad news. You know, maybe you've heard people say like, hey, give me some good news. Like, it's been a tough day. Give me some good news. And that's kind of like our default setting as bosses. Like, hey, I want some good news. But I'd love to say like, could you go in and say, hey, give me some bad news. Like, What's not working today? I want two things that are not working well we could do better. You know, as a way just to, to make it easy to speak truth to power. We had a, a waiter one time, Valentine's Day at Applebee's. Last time I was at Applebee's and probably the last time I'll ever be at Applebee's. Uh, this, this manager come over and, he, and he's like, hey, is everything wonderful tonight? And uh, it's kind of like, how do you want me to answer that question? Like there's one right answer to that and the answer is like, yes, it's been so great, right? It's, it's, instead of like, Hey, thanks for coming today. What, what could we do a little bit better to serve you? You know, that's what we've drawing out kind of that negative information. And so I say the same thing for, for you as a leader to say like, hey, anytime you have information, feel free to share it. That's nice. It's another thing to say, hey, could you, could you help me understand how I could have done a better job in that presentation? Or I feel like I didn't show up the way I wanted to show up. What, what did you see that, that I didn't see? So kind of this is a chance where in some ways you want to skew the question negative to make it easier for them to give you difficult information. You don't have to worry about hurting your feelings, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Your talking about that brings up a question that I'd like um, your input on. And I've heard in various talks that from speakers, if you say someone rubs you the wrong way or they have a habit or something that is hard for you to deal with, Look inside yourself, and mm. maybe you have that same problem. What's your take on mm. that? Because I think that's true. Mm. So her question, her question was, if someone rubs you the wrong way with their bad habit, is it because that's in you as well? I think is what you said. What you're saying? Yeah. yeah. That bothers you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe look inside yourself because you have that problem. Yeah. I don't have enough data to say that's universal for every problem, but I definitely think there are some issues for that, like. I hate arrogant people, mainly because I'm arrogant. And I'm like, hey, I should be talking. Why are you talking right now? Like, I want to fight with them for that. I'm kind of joking, but mostly serious right now. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, if, in my life, that's, that's definitely true. Like, I, a, a lot of things that frustrate me are things I don't like about myself. Um, I was working on a theory about that with one of my friends. Like, why do I get irritated? Why, why do I not care if someone's house is messy, but I really care if they, like, don't parent their kids very well? That just jumps all over me. Maybe that's something I'm insecure about. I don't know. Um, yeah. 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 Great question. Yeah. One more question. Then I want to make sure we have time to meet other people. I know that's a big, uh, important thing for for uh, first Fridays. Josh, really good stuff tonight. Russ leads things over lunch. Have these really good dates around this idea. You mentioned insight does not lead to change just because I know this doesn't mean I'm actually going to do something with it. So assuming personal responsibility for what I now know, what you've now shared with us. Yeah. And the thing that really gets, I think, me curious is when you hear people 
from that self-actualization piece or self-perception piece of thinking, I got leadership. I understand humility. Mm. Like, oh, I got it. And then they'll simply say, well, I don't want to do that because I'm being a humble leader. Mm. So they use it as a shield, a crutch, or leading out of fear without really, truly understanding what does it mean to be a humble leadership. So thinking about that insight, thinking about how to actually apply that, but also thinking in terms of when you hear people say that or when you come across that, how do you help them unpack that? How does that conversation go to think about do you really understand humble leadership? And are you really leading out fear or is it truly humble? Yeah. Yeah. So this, this, this is to summarize what I heard you say, the last piece of like, how do you distinguish leading out of fear, staying in the background versus like really leading from humility? Bury that little image of like the person in the blinds with a think that I put that here for you because I thought if Barry Schrock is here, he's going to ask this question <laughs> about timidity because I know Barry will argue you shouldn't always be humble. And I would say that says that you don't really understand what humility is if you think humility is timidity, right? Because, you know, the, the, while my default setting may be to stay in the shadows, if I have this greater purpose that's saying, hey, the, the team needs you to, to challenge them with a vision, if I'm a humble leader, I'm going to step up to the plate, even though it's not what I want to do. And yeah, I'm going to recognize where I, I have some gaps, and maybe I'm not the most articulate person, so maybe I'm going to partner with some people to help me do that or, or whatever. But ultimately, the, the purpose is going to help me rise to that challenge. It's not about what makes me comfortable, it's what my team needs from me. And if I'm doing that, hopefully that pulls me out of the shadows, even if I'd prefer to stay back uh, in the darkness. Yeah. Great question. Thank you all so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again. Great job. We really appreciate it. Feel free to stick around and talk with each other, meet, exchange.